Good morning and welcome to Modern Worship. We're so glad that you're here to worship this morning. Uh, we're going to do a special celebration of the mission trip during uh, Joys and Concerns. Um, but I just want to take a moment uh, to welcome you uh, and to begin this time with a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Oh, gracious and loving Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us, and we thank you for the privilege of being able to worship you in spirit and in truth. Open our hearts to the possibility of uh, knowing you more fully uh, through your word and through the witness of others and through this time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship together.
So we're going to share in our joys and concerns, but uh, before we do that, uh, we're going to share an amazing joy that uh, we experience together uh, as we uh, uh, celebrate the mission trip. So we're going to do a video, and then uh, we're going to ask anybody that wants to share a word that went on that trip that might want to share a word to be able to do that. So let's go with the video. And
So it's like a tradition, I think. So people that have been, uh, uh, we'll get to that in a second, newcomers to the trip, if you would want to share a word, you're welcome to do that. If you're not feeling completely comfortable doing that either. Uh, anybody that was a first time, how many people here were first time goers to Henderson? That was me. But I want to share a few words at least in that journey. Um, uh, so I've been anticipating this trip for a while and enjoyed uh, it immensely. It was just an amazing opportunity. We helped uh, Karen and Danny uh, with their house and helped them build a shed. And uh, it was just a great opportunity. They were so appreciative. Um, uh, Danny's dad was there for some of the time. We got to know his extended, their extended family, and that was an awesome thing. And we were leaving, and Larry... Uh, was moved by this story, but I was too. We were in the van, and I was uh, shotgun in the van, and Larry was driving, and the dad came up and said, roll down your window. So we rolled down the window, um, and uh, Danny's dad stuck his head in the window, and he said, we just want to thank, I want to thank you for helping, for you helping my son fix up his house, and it just melted our hearts. It was like an amazing moment in that journey uh, to be able to be uh, appreciated in that journey and and to make a difference it was a good trip in every respect I think uh, uh, from the trip there and back uh, Jackson wants to share a word <laughs> okay so I was getting to that you got stuck in that forest uh, partly Okay, so they wanted to talk about the cats on the site, and that's wonderful. But they also did get lost in the forest. Partly that might have been my fault a little bit in that journey. I didn't tell them specifically not to go too far out there. And there's at this Blue Heron place, it was really wonderful. It's a state park that, uh, that used to be a coal mining community, and they've replaced all of the original buildings with steel structures that have like a kiosk uh, of what would have happened. So we listened to what happened at the schoolhouse there, for instance, of so one of those buildings was the schoolhouse and you notice the chapel and I was preaching hellfire and damnation. No, not really. That's never been my style. Uh, but uh, it was uh, great. But, uh, and then there was this thing called Blue Heron Loop. So when you think about that, when you think about loop, you think and you let them go and they'll loop right back. But well, well, the loop wasn't as well marked as it should have been and the boys got way out ahead of us and I'm like chasing them through the woods trying to get them uh, back and yelling and screaming and uh, trying not to have a heart attack but it was all good and uh, we all got reunited and no harm no foul in that journey but I should have said stay close enough for us to be in contact and I didn't really make explicit instructions in that process but we had a wonderful time together the youth were great they worked hard uh, I'm proud of everyone that was on that trip because I think we represented Jesus and we represented St. Stephen's in an amazing way. And that's what it's all about, really, when we think about it and reflect upon that. And uh, we just had a, a, an amazing time together. I think we grew closer together and closer in one heart to service. And we're going to talk about that in the sermon today because it's about the Good Samaritan. Who is your neighbor? And our neighbors are everywhere. And uh, uh, we had an opportunity to minister to our neighbors uh, uh, Danny and Karen, and it was just a great time, and uh, appreciate the privilege. And I want to thank St. Thank Stephen's for allowing that to happen. Uh, funds that we raised with Pumpkin Patch and other things helped allow us to make a difference in uh, that family's uh, life. I think, I don't know why it is, but some of the most beautiful places in the world, and I think Frakes, Kentucky was gorgeous. It's just so beautiful. Just old growth forest and just wonderful and amazing are also some of the poorest places, and uh, we had the privilege to be able to help some folks in need, and it was uh, an awesome trip. Any other witnesses? Anybody else want to share how they might have been blessed in that process? If not, I'll go to our joys and concerns. And uh, so the Pages' granddaughters are with them. Suzanne and uh, Evelyn are at, uh, they're visiting the Pages, and that's making them very, very happy. Uh, Mark and Michelle Ushry celebrated their 34th wedding anniversary. Congratulations in that journey. Uh, that's uh, an awesome and a wonderful thing. Are there other joys or concerns that need to be shared? We need to remember Anne Green in our prayer. She had a heart cath, but uh, they did not do stents, and they're going to be able to treat her with medication. But to keep Anne in your prayers as she's recovering from that from Friday. And the other, and uh, 
Carol Hawkins' dad is still in the hospital. We need to remember Carol's dad in our prayers as well. Other joys or concerns? If not, let's quieten our spirits as we go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, gracious and loving Lord, we thank you so much for this amazingly beautiful day that you've given us, and we thank you for the privilege of being able to be your hands and feet in the world as uh, we went to Kentucky to experience that reality in our lives in a deeper way, and we're so grateful for that privilege. Lord, we thank you and praise you for all that you're doing and all that you want to do uh, in and through each one of us in St. Stephen's. Lord, we just pray that you'd open our hearts to the possibility of seeing who our neighbors are and blessing them in ways that would be significant and meaningful. Lord, we thank you and praise you today for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. We pray that you'd be with all of those that need your healing hand of love and mercy uh, that we've named and others that we might name in our hearts in these moments. We gratefully acknowledge that there's no distance in prayer, that as we agree our hearts together here in this place, your power is being released in the lives of those that need that touch. And today we say thank you for that great gift of your healing grace and virtue. We gratefully acknowledge that you are the great physician, the one who heals us, and we pray that your presence would be felt in the lives of uh, all those that need that touch. Lord, we bless you and praise you today for all that you're doing uh, in our lives and in our hearts together. We just pray that you would continue to open our hearts uh, to the work of your spirit in our lives uh, as we celebrate uh, this time of uh, ministry and mission and your presence. Uh, we thank you for all these things, but above all and in all things, we thank you for Jesus who came into the world to teach us the way to you, to teach us even how we could pray to you so he taught us to pray these words with meaning from our hearts. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand and worship together more this morning.
worship God through our giving uh, with the ushers would come forward for our tithes and offerings and we'll pray. Oh gracious and loving Lord, we thank you for all the gifts that you give us and we give back to you out of gratitude with glad and generous hearts because you've blessed us generously. And Lord, we pray that uh, we would use these gifts wisely, that your kingdom might come in fullness right here in Broken Arrow, the surrounding area, but around the world as well. I thank you in advance for the generous hearts of each giver. Bless them in their generosity. For we know deeply within our spirits we'd never be able to outgive you. And as we give these gifts, we know that you'll return many times over to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to share with you a familiar passage of scripture that you'll be uh, aware of from the Gospel of Luke, uh, the 10th chapter, beginning at verse uh, 25. And this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him into the inn, took care of him. And the next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Let's pray. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And we'd be quick to give you all of the praise and all of the glory. Amen. Well, I have a question this morning. Uh, what is something that is essential for human life and is highly contagious, yet we most of the time take it for granted? Can you think of something that answers all of those questions? I'm thinking of kindness. We'll say, well, is that a totally essential for life? Well, I don't know. I think it is really important when you think about it. I think uh, somebody asked the uh, um, anthropologist, Margaret Mead, what was the first sign of a civilization happening? And, you know, she could have answered that question a lot of different ways in that journey. She could have said, well, when you see the first primitive tool being used by a society, well, maybe that's the first sign of civilization. Or when you see artwork, like the cave paintings, or when you see something else, uh, pieces of pottery or whatever, that might be the first sign of uh, civilization is uh, beginning to emerge there. But she didn't agree with any of that. She said, well, I think the first thing that you would see maybe that would be a great indication or that's indication that civilization is happening in that group of people is when you see somebody that has a broken femur, that's the big bone in the leg, that's been mended. Because that represents somebody taking time to care for that person when they could not care for themselves. Amongst the hunting and gathering and all of those other things, they took time to care. They showed kindness. And I think really at the heart of it, isn't that what really makes us human? Isn't that what is uh, the thing that makes us human in that journey and that God is calling us to that end? Uh, sometimes kindness will cost us something, even in the story. The Samaritan uh, went to great lengths to show kindness, but it cost him something, didn't it? It cost him at least two silver coins and some other things, probably his time and effort in that process. Uh, the, the BBC uh, and the University of Sussex in the U UK uh, did a study on kindness. And they did a survey, and the, in that survey it was amazing that uh, people who saw and witnessed and saw acts of kindness were inclined themselves to do acts of kindness. There's some kind of contagion about that. And I think that's an amazingly beautiful thing. Remember uh, the book, Random Acts of Kindness? And you'd read those stories, and it'd make you want to go out there and think about uh, doing those things yourself, doing something, paying for uh, the person in McDonald's ahead of you or behind you or whatever in that journey. And uh, uh, sometimes when we uh, do acts of kindness, uh, that... Uh, perpetuates that and helps us as a society and as a people, I think, in that journey. Uh, isn't it amazing how Jesus interacts uh, with uh, individuals, even in this story? Uh, in his book, uh, Martin Copenhagen, uh, in his book titled Jesus is the Question, reminds us that only three times in the New Testament does Jesus directly answer a question. One of those times is in today's lesson when he's talking to uh, uh, the lawyer who comes to him and asks him, what must I do to be saved? And then the lawyer quotes back that wonderful 
uh, commandment to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But he can't quite settle for that because Jesus says, you've answered wisely in that journey. That's one time he says, yep, you got it right. You nailed it. But he just can't let it go, can he, the lawyer? Uh, and he says, uh, so who is my neighbor? And I think that spurs Jesus to share a story, and it's a beautiful story. There was a study done uh, in a, a brain institute in Paris that had a group of people listen to the same story. And eventually, uh, even if they were in different rooms, their hearts would tar- start to synchronize, beat in unison. Isn't that an amazing fact? And I think maybe that's what Jesus was trying to do when he tells a story. He doesn't always answer the question directly. Sometimes it would be easier for the person who is the way, the truth, and the life, who knows all and it is all, just if he would just answer the question. Because that would save me difficulty in coming to my own conclusions. But no, Jesus wants what? A relationship with us. And that's how that happens. It's by answering and thinking about the question. So she would rather have a a relationship with us. God would rather have a relationship with us than to just tell you that you're right or wrong. He wants us to grow in our understanding of God's mercy because I think if this story teaches us anything, it teaches us that God, at the very core of who God is, is merciful. We don't get what we deserve. Thank goodness, really, when we think about that. Um, That's the reality of what uh, Jesus shares in this uh, wonderful story today. And I hope, as we share this story together, that our hearts will beat us one, that we'll be synchronized with the understanding of who God is more fully, that God is merciful, and he loves us unconditionally, And amazingly, in that process, if Jesus were to answer the questions outright, that would provide us with certainty. But I think the questions prompt us to grow. And that's what God really wants from us and in us and through us. So the first question the story raises is, would you rather be right or would you better be right with God, I think? And there's a difference in that process. Sometimes we can be right in every way and not right with God or right in our relationship with God because we're not loving our neighbor as we love ourselves in that journey, that God calls us to do that. I think that as we're celebrating this Mission Sunday uh, in that trip, that was just a glorious opportunity to be able to what? Love your neighbor. And there's something liberating and freeing and wonderful about that. Now, it cost us something, didn't it? It cost us a week out of our life. It cost me a stiff knee for about two weeks after that from riding in that van all that way there and all the way back, you know, in the journey. But it was all worth it because of the expressions and the joy that we had in sharing with Donnie and Karen. People, good people with not a lot of material possessions, but good people that we could be in relationship with and minister to and with and talk to and get to know and that's what God wants us to do he wants us to be what in love with those around us and show the love of God to our neighbors so here's the lawyer he wants to justify himself so he says who is my neighbor and this is how Jesus answers doesn't answer the question directly in the New Testament uh, I think it's pretty remarkable. Jesus has asked 307 questions according uh, to uh, Copenhagen. And he, he asked 307 questions, and he's asked 183, and three times he answers them directly. Just three times, because he wants us to get that, that it's really about a relationship. It's really about not having to have the definitive answer or the right truth but it's about really having a relationship that you can build with God in that journey. And uh, so here's the man, and Jesus starts telling this story. And who are the main characters of the story when it comes down to it? Well, there's the man that went down to Jerusalem, down from Jerusalem to Jericho, which is kind of a tough place. Um, Dan Daly, who writes for one of the New York newspapers, overheard a lady talking about her neighborhood in New York City. 
And I'm unfamiliar with Manhattan, but they say there's a Houston Avenue uh, divides that north and south. So if you're in south of uh, uh, Houston Avenue, it's Soho, and if you're north, it's NoHo, and this lady was talking about her uh, neighborhood, and she said it's Oh No, <laughs> because it wasn't a very good neighborhood, obviously, it's dangerous, dangerous place to live, and that's the road to Jericho, when we think about it. When I think about the road to Jericho, my best experience that would help me envision that, because I've never been there, but it's descending about 2,000 feet from Jerusalem, because you know Jerusalem is the city built on the hill, isn't it? It's up on the mountains, but it's descending about 2,000 feet over about 18-mile journey, if you did that, uh, by land. So, but it's really, they're, they're a little bit closer together, because it's also going down the hill. But, uh, so I was in New Mexico, or not, uh, I say New Mexico, so that's one of my favorite places. But I was in Wyoming, uh, the one and only time that I was in Wyoming, and I went to this wonderful place called Ring Lake Ranch. It's awesome. If you ever get an opportunity to go to Ring Lake Ranch for any of their spiritual uh, places or uh, seminars or whatever, this mine was particularly on worship, and totally enjoyed that time. It was beautiful up there, and the first day I got the free time, and I went fly fishing, and I caught so many trout, it was just obscene. Uh, every time you cast a fly, the trout were taking it, and beautiful Snake River cuts, and uh, uh, brookies, both. And wow, what a, an amazing day. And I'm thinking, I want to go back so bad I can taste it. But I'm here for the seminar, so I probably ought to spend some time with uh, uh, the group. So I signed up for a nature walk, a guided nature walk. Uh, Leah, the guide, was going to take us on this walk up in the mountains. And it was a pretty incredible because there were uh, sheep there on the mountainside, uh, wild sheep. And it was just great. And we're walking along, and Leah stops. And, but only one other guy signed up, so I'm thinking, oh, I kind of wasted that. I was hoping to be with other people. But uh, we were hiking up to this high mountain lake. And uh, as we were continuing to hike up there, uh, Leah said, I'm going to rest here for a minute and write in my journal. You guys go on. And we did, because the trail was clearly marked and easy to follow. And we're walking along, and we turned on a turn. And I'm not kidding, from here to the doorway away, standing right in the middle of that trail was a mountain lion. That was the biggest thing I've ever seen. That cat was huge. And I thought about that, and I said, we could have been dead meat so many times because there were so many places where that cat could just climb up on a rock and jump down and eat us. And that's kind of how it was on that road to Jericho because it was notorious for what? Bandits and robbers. And here Jesus is telling that story. So the first person in the story is the traveler. The second persons are the robbers. They took advantage and exploited the poor man for all they could get from him. And then it would so happen that uh, there's a priest and a Levite both religious people, and both traveling. And it kind of indicates, I've always been told, you know, that uh, they couldn't touch him because they would become unclean and they were traveling to Jerusalem. But as you read the text more clearly and more fully, it seems like they're traveling away from Jerusalem in the same direction that the man was going. So they just didn't care. <laughs> they just didn't care about him. And they just wanted to avoid him. It was just a headache. It's just another problem that uh, I don't want to mess with. So they went around, and then the Samaritan, which that's ironic, isn't it? Jesus does it purposefully, I'm sure, when he creates this story, and he says, it was a Samaritan that what? Stopped and helped. And did everything within his power to help him. Bandaged his wounds, cleaned him out, put alcohol on him, and did all that he could. Took him and took him himself on his donkey and took him to the nearest inn. It stayed with him a whole night and then uh, gives two silver coins. It cost him something financially in that process too to have that innkeeper take care of him. It meant something to the innkeeper but mostly profit. But it meant something for the Samaritan to take care of that guy. And that's what? That's what Jesus says, who is your neighbor? And he asks, the lawyer then, well, who do you think of all these people as this man's neighbor? He said, well, certainly the one who had compassion or showed kindness to him. And I think that's really amazing. And as we think about that and reflect upon that, that's what we should be about as well, that God would remind us uh, that we too should take pity on those who are in a difficult place. 
Fred Craddock, the great preacher, tells a story about uh, meeting a, a, a rear admiral, Thornton Miller, who was uh, in World War II. And uh, when he was in World War II, he was a chaplain. He was not yet an admiral, obviously, but he was a chaplain. And uh, he was on the beach during uh, D-Day at Normandy. And he was going up and down, praying with whoever he could find, anybody that was injured or hurt or whatever. Uh, and some of the seminary students, uh, they wanted him to talk about his war stories, obviously. But uh, they said, well, why did you do that? Why did you put yourself in harm's way? And he said, simply one word, a couple word answer. He says, I'm a minister. So they continued to question him. They continued to ask him questions. Well, when you were on the beach, did you ask if they were Presbyterians or Catholic or Jewish? And he says, no, I, all I did is ask, can I help you? And I think that's at the heart of it, isn't it? It says, what is our inner attitude about helping others around us? Are we there so that we can love our neighbors and help those around us? Because that's what's really important. That's what the, is the heartbeat of the story, don't you think? It is your heart becoming in sync with what uh, Jesus is trying to do in the story. Are your heart, is your heart beating with the rhythm of God? Are you thinking more and more in this moment, well, how do I love my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And what do I do in that process? How do I express my love to my neighbor? John Jordan, and I'll close with this story, uh, was a retired fireman in 1992, and uh, the war was going on in uh, Bosnia. And uh, he's noticing that a lot of buildings were burning. That was just complete destruction. And mayhem over there and that the firemen that were there had very little protection. They were fighting fires in t-shirts because they didn't really have any firefighting protective gear. And he thought, well, I saw that on TV and he says, I could do something about that. He got together and got a collection of all of the retired firefighting equipment that he could find in New York City. And he took it over there and he started a firefighting school to teach them how to fight fires as safely as possible. And then they brought as much equipment as he possibly could. And somebody said, well, why did you do that? Seems like it was a big expense and a large expenditure of your time. And he says, you know, if you see a person in a car wreck on the side of the highway, you're going to do one of two things if you're like there. You're either going to stop and help or you're just going to blow by. And he said, I just couldn't blow by. I needed to stop and help. And that's what Jesus is saying. That we've got to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Because that's really the heartbeat of God. It's, you, know, you know it's good and it's wonderful to have perfectly sound theology and know all about God, priests and Levites. But if you don't really know God, if you're not in relationship with God, you don't know the heart of God. And the heart of God is always to have compassion. That's what I believe in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of God's precious Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, may you go forth from this place with kindness in your heart and enthusiasm to love your neighbors as God loves us. We'll see you next time.